Capital Report is a production of Senate Media Services. Declining child care options and shortages of home health care workers are just two issues keeping legislative committees busy. Two lawmakers highlight their ongoing efforts, plus a close-up look at some gorgeous Capitol murals. All of this and more on this week's Capitol Report. Welcome to this week's program, I'm Shannon Lurkey. About one third of the state budget is devoted to programs administered by the Minnesota Department of Human Services. Because demand for these services is projected to increase in coming years, legislative committees and working groups are working to find cost-effective ways to streamline services. The Senate Committee on Human Services Reform has been meeting periodically throughout the interim, and the chair of that committee, Senator Jim Abler, now joins me in the studio, welcome. Yeah, thanks for having me, nice to be back. Before we get to some of the reform work, uh, the committee has been dealing with a state law that was passed last session that requires children age 13 and older who live in a home-based child care setting to be fingerprinted and photographed. The providers are not thrilled about having their children treated like criminals, as they've said, and yet the state has an interest in ensuring that these children are safe, the children in these settings. So where is the balance? Well, absolutely. You want to be sure that the children who are brought in for a day at their child care place can go home and enjoy their evening with their parents. Uh, and so safety is very important, but sometimes it's too much and the requirements are unreasonable. So the, the proposal which came from the department in the name of compliance with federal requirements uh, said that if you're a 13 year old girl living, 13 to 17 year old child, girl, whatever, um, yeah, just in the house mm -hmm. and uh, you come home and I can't get, wait to get away from those kids, that we're going to do fingerprints on you. Already they had a background check and if they had concerns about if this person was dealing drugs or had some bad uh, tendencies, they could already do a, ba a fingerprint study. And so this is too much. It was billed as compliance with the federal rules. Federal compliance was age 18 and up and so it was um, misbilled. And the department realizes, I think, it's a bit of an overreach. I think there's a consensus we can undo this um, unnecessary bit of oversight. This is a very challenging time for these young uh, teenagers anyway, with school and clothes and, and to add fingerprinting into their list of things they have to do, it's just too much. And I think that uh, we can repair this and uh, go back to how it was, which was as safe as it could be. In-home child care providers have said that there are loads of regulations. Um, they've pointed to that as one of the reasons why these are closing. And, and the Center for Rural Policy and Development did a full study last year. They've updated the policy, or the, their study this year. Uh, the update shows that licensed family child care has continued to plummet, although child care centers appear to be taking up the slack. In your view, how important is the home-based child care? I can tell you from my own experience, that's what I used when my kids were little. I liked the home environment versus the center, but these, these are going yeah. out of business. They're not interested in staying in business. Well, especially in greater Minnesota, it's, it's a bit of a crisis that you, they've lost, I think, 15,000 slots, and there aren't no child care centers to go around, and as you say, many- There's a statewide shortage, yes. Many parents prefer to have their their child go to the woman or the man that they know who's going to look after them for their formative years. And so sometimes good ideas that, good ideas that come out of St. Paul or in some office about compliance or this fingerprinting or some other set of rules in real life don't make any sense. And so we're trying to, in our committee, look through and say which rules are driving people out of business. Uh, there's some rules about care for students with children with disabilities. They're so onerous that nobody cares for children with disabilities. So now you're trying to go to work and there's nobody who will take your child because the rules are so onerous. Well now you, well there's no harm, but there's no service. And so how do you balance that? And the, the real answer is to try to figure out which kind of, which individual providers are the ones that are at risk with being not even good people to, to regulate. And the, the good providers try hard. They might make a mistake, but usually they're minor and uh, well-intended. And so the trick is to get after bad intent and people that are just not doing their job to protect the children. At the end, you want to be safe, but you need providers. And so you want, your committee wants to keep looking at ways to find that really delicate balance. It is a balance. And if you make a mistake, you're on the front page. And there's some tragedy. And 
It's a really hard topic, and actually the more that the citizens and the providers and parents weigh in about that, it actually helps, because we don't know everything. <laughs> uh, let's turn to admit that on TV, <laughs> no, no. Let's, let's turn for a minute um, just to the whole concept of reform in general. A common criticism of government programs is, is that they're siloed and that one, one agency isn't speaking to another agency. And in terms of finding reform, saving money, if some of these agencies could communicate, that maybe would be a solution. Is that one of the things that you're looking at? And how does privacy factor in? Well, privacy is very important. And so I'm a... You should have your privacy. It's all we have left anymore in some cases, and even not so much of that. If you're a family in the system, uh, in the social service system with you know, um, assistance of various kinds, or you're in probation departments, or if you're a special ed, or things in the, that you're going to be part of the system, right now, actually we changed the law this year so that those agencies can talk to each other about you and your child with your permission. And so before, the public health couldn't talk to social services, couldn't talk to probation, couldn't talk to other administrative areas about your family and, they're all, and the school district. And so if they could communicate, um, that will help a lot. And so we passed the law. Senator Ralph worked very hard on that this session to come up with a way that the counties can have the family opt in. They can elect. They cannot, if they don't want to, they can, still won't talk. But if they choose to help their child and their family in a better way, they can do that. I'm really excited about that. That was... A so minor it's a coordinated change. effort then. Yeah, but it's a major change. And so somebody called it bold. And your viewers are like, it's bold that the people that are working in the same family talk to each other? Well, welcome to government. Yes, that was a bold improvement. And we hope it turns out to have some of the good impacts that we're hoping for. The next state budget will devote $24 million to increase wages and training for personal care providers uh, who serve elderly and disabled populations to help address the shortage of, of workers in this industry. Over the summer, the Attorney General brought charges against three people who'd built almost a million dollars from the state through a fraudulent personal care agency. Is your committee going to address the fraud? And it's, it's again, it's that balance thing. You, you have programs to help people, and yet you have fraud that takes that money away that, for the efficiencies. <laughs> None of this money is free. This money belongs to your viewers. The, the taxpayers pay quite a bit of money into Minnesota, and they trust us to make it work to solve problems that they, we all care about. And so the PCA is care for people with special needs, with seniors, people with disabilities, and we think that's a great idea. There's always some bad apples that want to take the system and abuse it and drive a truck through a loophole. At the same time, most of the providers are really good, and the, these providers make $12 an hour, and it's hard to even get enough of them. So how do you balance some dishonest person with the needs of the individuals. That's what we're working on in the interim. And so we try to crack down on fraud, but at the same time drive away some people who might want to be very good providers. And so we want to find out and make them focus on what really is fraud and not just which is a mistake or which is some clunky method. If you have enough demands for paperwork, not doing the paperwork itself becomes an infraction. Mm -hmm. And so what's the right amount of recording? And there's a lot of work about that. But every penny that people trust us with needs to go to the function that it's supposed to do. And otherwise, we can't serve the people that need it. And, some, and then bad things do happen to those people who can't get out of bed. Um, some of the people that are needing services of these PCAs, but for the fact that they help someone, get, that someone helps to get out of bed, they're in bed all day. And which because they're, they're, just, they're paralyzed or whatever, and really compelling stories. And so how do we balance the work with proper administration? And again, another fight all the time, but, right. but we have to, the people admit that we should agree we should serve the individuals, and so we try very hard at that. And that is the goal of your committee. Senator Abler, I <laughs> want to thank you so much. Well, thanks for having me, and it's good that people stay engaged. A key Senate committee heard about the latest state efforts to fight infectious diseases, including work to educate Somali Americans that vaccinations for measles, mumps, and rubella are unrelated to autism. I ran into a Somali mom just last week. Two of her kids were vaccinated, two were not. They talk about kids who were and who were not. And, and so they don't know what to do. They try to trust what you're saying. And they tell the doctors and your workers their story, and it's like they're treated like they're crazy. And so you have to acknowledge that there's a risk. 
And it seems like your department is unwilling to do that. And I'm just reminding you, if ever you're going to get these folks to trust you, you want to say, oh, you're right. Uh, tell me your story and listen to them as though you're truly researching and truly scientific and not dismiss those as some comments of a person who's totally irrational. I just wanted to tell you that. It seems like it comes up and that's, that's what they want. And then they can make an informed choice if they would like to do it or not. But until you deal with that, you're going to continue to see those, those trends and concerns continue. You may have missed the last part of my presentation in which I talked about our Somali outreach worker reaching out to families to talk to them about their experiences. So that was what we're doing with um, the funding that we are receiving through the public health response funds is to extend that position. Um, and I know that there have been um, concerns expressed in an, a letter that was sent back um, that I think you were CC'd on. We did provide um, resources to the community and to, um, to you and to other members explaining some of the um, resources that are available at the federal level for healthcare providers um, of these patients if they have questions and concerns about vaccination and about potential um, side effects from vaccination. The obligation that we have is to present to patients that there has been no linkage uh, between widespread use of the MMR vaccine uh, and any of the various sundry complaints that have been anecdotally linked with it. Uh, we know that based on statistical uh, and widespread epidemiological studies. Uh, there may be individual cases where things happen, but we just cannot substantiate that, and our obligation is to present that evidence to patients to the best of their, our ability. Uh, so the reply certainly should be to uh, offer what we know, offer what we know as, as a society based in study and scientific inquiry. Uh, so I applaud your efforts and your approach. A shortage of home health care workers already exists, and the Minnesota Department of Human Services projects that an additional 60,000 positions will need to be filled by the end of the decade due to increasing numbers of individuals needing services. The legislature has formed a working group to analyze the shortage and to make recommendations to address the problem. Senator Jerry Ralph is co-chair of the working group, and he now joins me in the studio. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Last year, there was an article in the Star Tribune about the home care worker shortage, calling it a crisis. There's two stories that were particularly um, heartbreaking. A single mother had to admit her daughter to the hospital because she didn't have a home health care worker any longer. And the reason for the admittance was a home care failure. Another mother who has a high paying job had to take a leave from her job in order to care for her three year old because of the shortage of workers. Are wages at the heart of the problem? That's a complicated question because the wages themselves are derived from a couple of sources. Uh, the federal uh, uh, programs and Medicaid and Medicare do have some effect on the wages that are paid for home, home health care. Uh, the, the issue is broader. The wages do enter in, but there's a, there's a much broader uh, issue here, and uh, we can get into that if, uh, as we go forward. But suffice to say, it's not just wages. Um, there, that, that is a component. Well, I know there's also a tightening workforce. Mm -hmm. um, there's also the changing demographics of the elderly population that's, that's um, retiring, needing more services. And there's a desire among many folks to keep those people in their homes as long as possible. Mm -hmm. Are those also factors? There, that, that's one of the major problems is, is that because of the changing demographics, the nature of the care that's needed, uh, there just aren't enough people, and so the, the people that are in, the biz in, in that business are going to, the, to obviously, to the higher-paying jobs. Uh, the, the other issue, though, is the qualifications that are being required for people to fill those positions, and that's the focus of our working group, is to try and look at uh, what it is that actually could be performed in the, in the care, the delivery of care, at a level that doesn't have to rise to an LPN or an RN. Uh, because that's where the, 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 the crunch is coming. And one of the statistics that we've looked at is, is that if we continue to use RNs and LPNs to fill these, these, all of these positions, there are not enough uh, seats in the universities throughout the state of Minnesota, even if they were completely filled for the next two years, we'd still fall behind. 
So we have to find an alternative source of, of delivery of care, and that's part of what the focus of the group is on, is to determine what tasks can be performed that do not raise to the level of RN or L LPN, and at the same, same time maintain the, the integrity of the, of the certification process of the credentialing. And that's a complex, uh, complex issue, and that's what we're basically tackling in, in terms of determining what kind of work can be performed and then who can perform it and how do we educate them without having to spend two or two and a half years and getting someone into the system. Is, is it possible that there could be maybe different tiers of, of qualifications so that you know there's there's maybe a basic level that doesn't require the LPN and and it could be you know aggregated like that is that one way to possibly address this is this? exactly where we're focused is on trying to examine as I said the various the various care needs that are that are out there who can perform them and who we can find to fill those positions and provide what we would call a ladder or a lattice that would allow someone to grow in the field. And this is another, we, we were looking at it kind of as a marketing idea that we want to attract people to the field. Uh, it's not a very glamorous field in many cases. It can be very difficult and, and even emotionally, physically and emotionally challenging work. Yes, it is. And, and what we want to do is try and find ways in addition to compensation that will reward people. Credit for time towards a higher degree, for example, would be one, would be one possibility. If someone so, has served for a year in a healthcare position, they would get some credit towards the actual final uh, whatever level of degree they're looking for. Uh, and again, we're explore, exploring these options. Uh, we we want to maintain the integrity of the system. It's a very great concern. And this was one of the major concerns that came up at committee when we were working on this. But we also need to find a way to attract people train them and get them into the system quickly. Uh, our, and as you pointed out, the demographics are changing. We, we just, one healthcare provider that I'm aware of had over 300,000 hours of unfilled time that was already allocated and they couldn't find people to fill it. So we have a real, real, real crisis here. And, and so we're trying to approach it from multiple angles. Some have argued that unionization would be a solution. Is that viable? Is that something that th worth looking at in your view? The, the problem, I believe, is the, the, the nature of the duties. And once you've identified the tiers or levels, uh, if we then have to figure out a way to compensate people in, in, in a fashion that's appropriate. Unions might, might provide an avenue for that. Um, uh, as an evaluation of the tasks that are necessary, uh, part of my background, I was a, an HR person uh, for a major company and actually did that kind of work evaluating the value of a job and what it should be paid for, paid for it. Mm -hmm. And so that's something we are looking at and tr then trying to find the money to do that. But, but we do definitely need to evaluate. And because we haven't identified what those tasks are going to be yet, it's pretty hard to say how much we should be paying them to do that. Uh, but that's something we're definitely looking at. Well, one other possibility would be the fact that more families are simply deciding to keep their, their elderly or whoever family members in their home and care for them themselves. Sometimes that requires that someone uh, cut back their hours at work or even leave their job entirely. But then there, that makes it an affordability issue for families who want to care for their loved ones themselves. Will your committee also look at ways for families to be able to better afford caring for people on their own? Yes, the, one of the ways we relieve the shortage. I, I've often said that uh, we don't have enough nursing beds and, care, and skilled care facilities to take care of people, but we do have enough beds. They're called people's homes. Mm -hmm. And the longer we can keep people in their homes, and even through the providing of, of, of uh, low intensity services, uh, somebody coming in once a day to help with complex tasks that the, that the person who is providing the home care can't provide. Uh, very, the various other ways of trying to enhance the home-based care uh, system. And, and we're definitely focusing on that because we feel that is probably the most cost-effective way to meet this shortage is to keep Help, help people stay in their homes either independently or with min, minimal support. Uh, it's, a, it's, a bang, it's a bang for the buck that we can't get by trying to bring people into uh, consolidated care facilities or having a, a full-time home care uh, assistant in the home. 
And, and so we're looking at that, and we certainly encourage that as, as a route to try and alleviate the shortage. Is there any way, um, you, there's, the public perception of this kind of work is, is not very glamorous. Is there any kind of marketing campaign that maybe should be done to, to make people more excited to pursue this line of work and help people that, that need this kind of help? Yes, I think that this goes back to what we were talking about, about in one respect some of the incentives by providing a ladder or a pathway for someone to start as a home care assistant and ultimately through education, experience and time achieve a, a higher level of, of uh, degree of education and credentialing and, and, and provide that as, a, as something built into the system as a reward. And to offer that to show people that, to, number one, that there's a, there's a path. If they don't really like doing the, the menial tasks, there is a way to, to advance beyond that. But secondly, to, to, to in, uh, appeal, if you wish, to people's nurturing nature and to get people to see that this is actually something that's a very rewarding career. Senator Rolf, it's so nice to have you here. Thank you for coming today. Well, thank you, and I appreciate the opportunity to give people information on this desperate crisis. So thank you. Capitol architect Cass Gilbert believed that placing fine art within the Capitol building would advance the education, civilization, and intelligence of the state. Brian Pease of the Minnesota Historical Society provides insights into painter Edwin Blashfield's Senate Chamber murals. One of the many areas in the state capitol that is filled with beautiful artwork is the Senate Chamber. There's two very large murals overlooking Senate proceedings. How did they come to be here? Well, that was all part of the original vision of Cass Gilbert, the architect of the state capitol. When you walk through the building, he's always, as he was planning the, the design and the, and the shape of the spaces, he was always incorporating art and architecture together. So he would design a room where he would put the notable architectural features, but also create space for art. Because in this style of architecture, it's the Beaux-Arts style of architecture, which was a school of thought that when you build a public building, you incorporate the educational moments too. So you have this beautiful classical architecture, but you have paintings that tell you stories about the state or whatever building you're, you're telling, telling the stories of that state or that building's history. So that's what was happening in this space. These are two large murals that really talk about important events or kind of how we became a state we were in 1900 when this building was being built. The mural on the north wall it depicts the headwaters of the Mississippi. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, that's called the, the Discoverers and Civilizers Led to the Source of the Mississippi River. Has a long name. It does, yeah. And so it's, once again, it's focusing on the idea that the, the Mississippi River has been a, a, something that people have been, had to, been exploring to find that source for, for decades, for centuries. People were looking to find that source because no one knew if it was connected to Hudson Bay or if you could find a, a passage to the Northwest and so forth. So the figures on, on one side are those explorers, going all the way back to the French explorers, to the people who eventually did find that source of the Mississippi River in 1832. And the other side has the people, once that land and, and so forth, that source was discovered, people are being shown moving in to that land. And then in the center, you have the, the Manitou, uh, the father of waters who was actually pouring, starting the flow of the river from an urn. And then you also have two uh, Indian people represented there and one is kind of in a defensive position because, because of the European influence, things are going to be changing for them and for their people. But once again, you're looking at the building from the eyes of the builders of this building in 1900. So the Mississippi River, that was the lifeblood for the entire state's history. You had cities built there. You had the water falls on St. Anthony that was generating the water power for the flour mills. And so that, that river was a vital part and still is a vital part of our, our history. And the mural on the south wall brings in uh, the patriotism of Minnesota and Minnesota's agriculture. Can you talk more about that? Right, that's also a very interesting depiction because it's talking about uh, not only the agricultural history, but it throws in the state's patriotism. So on the far right side, when you look at, if you're standing in front of that painting, it has Civil War soldiers. So that represents our willingness to volunteer to fight in that Civil War. And then in the center has an oxen that's pour, pulling a large cart with all the produce, all the products that we can generate as an agricultural state. And then the families, the people, the farmers that are coming in to use that land to make it a very prosperous state. 
And what's really, uh, really neat about those depictions is there's also kind of a, uh, Edwin Blashville, the artist, is telling a little bit of a time warp or time change because you see with those Civil War soldiers, you'll see the younger soldiers in the foreground and in between the cart and the other soldiers on the far right are the old veterans. So now you've had this time from 1861 to 1905 where the, those soldiers now are the gray-bearded veterans that are coming back to the state capitol. And there's something important hidden in plain sight. Can you tell us about that? Sure, yeah. One of the things that Evan Blashville, the artist, wanted to do is to recognize uh, Cass Gilbert, who was the architect of the building, and then Channing Seabury, who was the vice president of the Capitol Building Commission, pretty much the head official for that whole process. And so he said in, in the Renaissance time, an artist would often you know, only be successful because he had a patron to help him you know, support his career and help do the work uh, that you know, the patron wanted to be done. So as a consideration for that support, those artists of the Renaissance would often put a, their patron's face or their features in, into a painting. And so in a sense, it's a thank you for a, the commission. Yeah, it, it's a recognition for the work that these two men did to make this building happen. And so those are found at the far left side of the, the painting that uh, kind of behind one of those uh, classical figures, you can see the profiles of those two important figures. The artist Edwin Blashfield came to Minnesota for the installation of these paintings, and then they stood relatively untouched, I understand, until 1988 with the first restoration effort, and then they were restored again for the grand reopening of the Capitol. Can you talk about those restoration efforts? Sure. The whole uh, history of these paintings has kind of been clouded in, in you know, just a few obscure references to some work that might have been done in the 30s. Uh, there's some photos of them bringing an artist or even people to clean the murals of the dust and the grime. and if you think back in 1900, 1905, 1910, 1920, they're burning coal. So you're going to have this fine sooty layer that's going to be on all the surfaces. We discovered a lot of the paintings, not only in the Senate chamber, but all over the building, had sections of them overpainted. So in the 30s, they brought in artists to probably give them an employment or the some part jobs. Part of the works project. Right. So they would be employed, you know, give them some work to do, and then they subtly changed colors, they added things to the paintings, the compositions are still the same. And so once again, that's something you can't see until you actually go and physically investigate that. So in 88, they were cleaned, they um, had a conservator come in and cleaned off the old varnish and the dirt and the grime. And then when we had this last project, we had the conservators actually go back and remove the non-original paint. So the new paint was chipped away with knitting needles and bone folders, anything with a sharp tip or whatever the conservator preferred, they inch by inch chipped away all the non-original paint to get back to the original colors. And what we see today is really a reflection of what Edmund Blashfield had wanted for the colors and the designs that we see today. The goal was to make these look as they did in 1905 when the building opened, and that's the goal for the next many, many decades. Join us again next week as we delve into more topics affecting Minnesotans. I'm Shannon Lurkey, and on behalf of all of us at Senate Media Services, thanks for watching.